It's been way too long since he was on the show last. Pat Buchanan, former presidential candidate, author, journalist, activist, who joins us now from Washington. Always a pleasure. How are you, Pat? Doing fine, Michael. Good, good to see you. Now, let, let's talk about whether the country is doing fine or not, meaning the United States of America. Uh, you, you have a, a, a Democrat president. You may well have a Democrat president for quite a bit of time to come. Do you think I'm right? Uh, we could very well have a Democratic president for a good while to come. I think Hillary Rodham Clinton is probably the Democratic nominee in 2016. And it's hard for me to see any of the present Republican contenders who are talked about defeating Hillary Clinton, uh, Michael. It would be a tough uphill run. Mm. Are uh, any of them, though, genuine... <laughs> That's re not good news, huh? No, well, I, I'm, <laughs> hey, I'm a Canadian. I can sit back and just observe. But, I mean, what, what occurs to me is that some of those who may run against her, they're not going to be fundamentally different. They may be Republican in name, but they're hardly conservative. Well, uh, many, some of them really are not conservative, and others are. But I will say this. One of the problems the Republican Party has is, if you will, the dissolution of the conservative movement. For mm -hmm. example, there are other social conservatives who believe in right to life and who don't believe in same-sex marriage. And many folks in the party, especially in the establishment, would like to be rid of their issues and focus more on the economy. So you've got a division there. You've got a division in the Republican Party on foreign policy. Some folks are anxious to go to war against Iran, I believe. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority of Americans are not. Right. Let's talk about the country as a whole, because even if the Republicans did come to power, it seems to me they'd have to change the way they presented themselves. And social movements go beyond politics. You mentioned that the issues of, of life issues, same-sex marriage even more. Do, do you really believe a president can win, someone can win the presidency and be firmly opposed to same-sex marriage or be firmly in support of unborn life? Can they still win the, the race? I think you can be pro-life and win the race, because I think a lot of younger Americans are increasingly becoming pro-life, odd as it seems. But with same-sex marriage, I think that issue really is a cutting issue with young people and libertarians, and there's no doubt that the movement is in that direction. That is the civil rights cause of the new century for an awful lot of young Americans. But the issue, all these issues, I think, of, of, of basically of marijuana legalization and things like that, I think you can still win as a Republican holding your views on those issues. And let me add this, Michael. If you walk away from life, if you walk away from traditional marriage, if you come out for legalized marijuana, I don't know how you win the Republican nomination. Yeah. Yeah, well, th that's a very good point, because to be president, you have to win a nomination to be a Republican candidate. Uh, you're not going to get the Christian vote, whether it's evangelical or serious Catholic, if, if you're indifferent to the marriage and life issues. No, you won't. What they will do is they will simply stay home, maybe go for a third party candidate or be sort of indifferent and unenthusiastic. A way, a way that the uh, number of Republicans and conservative Republicans were with the candidacy of Governor Mitt Romney. Mm. Yeah. I want to talk about you for a few, few moments. You, you, your books, and you're working on a new book right now, they sell extremely well. They, they say things which are radical and different, and, and they can't just be put into categories. But you, although you're still welcomed on, on TV and radio and in journalism, some doors have been closed to you, which I think is enormously regrettable, if not per pernicious. Mm -hmm. um, has it got better or worse over the years? Well, you know, I genuinely believe, Michael, that every, every establishment has its own ways of silencing dissent or, or circumscribing dissent. I mean, in the Greek, uh, the old city-states, they took care of Socrates one way. Mm -hmm. We know what happened in Jerusalem a long time ago with the greatest man who ever lived. But I think in, 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 in our society, there's no doubt about it that certain viewpoints are now considered politically incorrect, which were not. 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. My views fundamentally on an awful lot of issues have not really changed because they were imbued in you as a youth. And they have to do with morality and right and wrong and what you think the country ought to be like and what is a good society. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't bother me really. I, you know, you anticipate it. Yeah, I have to say, I admire you very much in, in that area in particular, because I know that doors have been closed, and I think the reasons are completely spurious, and, and you've reacted quite graciously. I don't think I would have been as, as forgiving as you've been. Well, <laughs> I don't know that I have too much other alternative, but there's a lot of things you're still... 
<laughs> still able to do, Michael. I go down in my basement and I write my books. I write a syndicated column. It's not picked up in the same major newspapers, but that's partly because I ran three times for president. Yeah. And But look, nobody can say Pat Buchanan doesn't have a good life and hasn't been warmly and extensively rewarded you know, by society, if you will, and by your friends and everything. Look, I've really got no complaints. We've, you know, if you don't lose any battles, you've never gotten into any great fights. Yeah, that's, that, that's a, a good point, very well made. That what is going on in Washington now, though? Again, aside from party politics, there were certain assumptions uh, about America, uh, whether it, it was a Roosevelt or, or an Eisenhower, whether it was a, 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 a Truman or, a, I don't know, a Woodrow Wilson. There were assumptions that America was exceptional. It had a special place in the world. It was different from Europe. It was the new world. Have we lost some of that now? I think the concept of American exceptionalism it's got several different meanings. Most of us who are Americans believe we are a unique and great country and really the greatest the world has ever seen. And, and we love this country and we believe in it. But some have used the idea of American exceptionalism as though the United States were given some, man, some mandate from on high to reshape the world in our image. Mm -hmm. which is an impossibility. Yeah. One scholar I recall said, you know, the Constitution of the United States is not for export. <laughs> it is unique to a particular time and place and people, and the, what we are now is a development and an evolution out of that. Mm -hmm. And you can't impose that on Afghanistan and turn them into a, you know, sort of a Central Asian version of Iowa. Yeah. No, you, you really, the, the irony, of course, is that the British idea of the 18th century was make the world like Britain. And, and in rebelling from, from Britain, the United States for the longest time tried to, to replicate that. We're, we're going to have more with you tomorrow, Pat, discussing foreign policy. But until then, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Michael.